Good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank, thank, thank you very much for being here. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure and, and privilege for me to start by uh, saying that this is uh, the first sort of engagement that I've had in this house under the umbrella of Brookings India. Brookings India has uh, been established only recently, thanks to the uh, visionary support of about 25 people from India, mostly from India, and three or four from outside India, but all of whom who ha have an interest in India. It's, uh, it's an extraordinary, in my view, testament of the interest of corporates, both individuals and corporate houses, in the um, desire for a policy framework or poli a think tank that will have that will be uh, able to provide nonpartisan and rigorous uh, research, and that, as a result of the quality of the research, it will hopefully be able to shift the needle of policy somewhat. I have uh, to thank uh, a number of people who have made it possible, some of whom are here. I'm not going to go through them individually, but I do say that the, you know, the, the, the view that, or the, the thesis that corporates don't actually support activities other than those that are of direct interest to them has, is belied by their readiness to support Brookings India. I've taken over as uh, the chairman of Brookings India, and I'm thrilled by, this, by the prospect of having to develop, along with other colleagues, uh, a think tank of national and international repute, which of course has a, is a, has a seamless relationship with Brookings in Washington, which is uh, one of the better known uh, uh, think tanks in the world. I'm really thrilled that Tom accepted Brookings uh, invitation, Brookings India's invitation to come and uh, talk to us tonight. Um, he has been here for a week and um, this is his last evening and I dare say that he's very tired but notwithstanding that he's uh, taken, taken the time off to spend this evening with us. And I'm really grateful that all of you have uh, you know, managed to come here literally on, on schedule. So, um, what we're going to do uh, for the next 45 minutes or so is really have a conversation with Brookings. I'm going to ask him a few questions, but then I have mics, and uh, I'm sure all of you will have uh, questions for him as well. Tom, um, once again, thanks very much. And let me start by, uh, by asking you, uh, by start, let me start with America. I mean, your most recent book um, is a book about American domestic policy. You're a foreign policy expert, but you decided to write about America's domestic policy. And I understand that you did that because um, you were concerned that America has essentially lost its way. But you were confident that America can get back on track. Um, you say that you're a frustrated optimist. You're frustrated because what needs to be done is not being done, and yet you're optimistic because America is essentially a very dynamic uh, society, a very dynamic economy. But um, sitting from where I am, I, um, I reflect and I think you know, that America has, over the last three years, almost twice committed economic suicide. Um, it has just re-elected the same distribution of power that has brought America to uh, the crisis that one sees facing the economy and politics. Obama has been re-elected, you have a Democratic Senate, and you have a Republican House of Representatives. So my question really to you is, um, are you still an optimist? Are you, do you really think that America will be able to get its act together? 
Do you think that the government, that Obama's administration, will be able to assert national interest over sectional parochial interests? Well, that's a great place to start, Vikram, and thank you uh, for hosting me in your house. Um, uh, I think Brookings is a wonderful institution, and I'm uh, thrilled that it's going to be partnering with uh, India to um, uh, really collaborate on solutions to your problems and ours, I suspect. And this is such an amazing audience, I just want to interview everybody. Um, <laughs> so everybody just stay, and I'm going to get my laptop when we're done. Um, let me just make sure this is set. So, yeah, I've, my last book is called, uh, which I wrote with a, a colleague, Michael Mandelbaum. Um, uh, it's called, um, turned down a little bit. Uh, that used to be us, how America lost its way in the world it invented, and how we can come back. And whenever we tell people the title of the book, uh, their first question inevitably is, um, but, 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 but does it have a happy ending? And uh, we tell everybody it does. We just don't know yet whether it's fiction or nonfiction. Um, we're working on that. Um, how did two foreign policy geeks end up writing a book about domestic American politics? Uh, we have my, my co-author, Michael Mandelbaum, is the chair and professor of international relations at Johns Hopkins. We are friends for 20 years. We talk about the world um, uh, almost start every day talking to each other on the phone. We live around the corner from each other about the world. But we noticed something over the last few years, that, that is that we'd start every day talking about the world, then we'd end every day talking about America. Um, and it became clear to us that America, its fate, future, vigor, and vitality, was actually one of the biggest foreign policy issues in the world. Um, because America, Lord knows, we, we um, make our share and more of mistakes around the world, but America also provides, uh, we believe, an enormous amount of global public goods, whether it's uh, you know, promoting uh, global trade or stabilizing uh, the sea lanes in the Pacific. Um, and we're, we're pretty convinced that if we go weak as a country, and we cannot provide those global public goods, uh, our kids won't just grow up in a different America, they'll grow up in a fundamentally different world. And um, a world ordered by China or, or by Russia, or most likely by nobody at all. And um, so that was really the, the impetus for the book. What worries me about America most right now, uh, Vikram, is that a um, little closer. I'll just hold it. No. Sorry. I didn't wear the white shirt shirt for this, I guess. How's that? Is that a little better? Um, just hold it in my hand. So what, um, what concerns me most about America today is that um, we're actually uh, taunting taunting in the NBA basketball sense. Um, the two most autistic, autistic in the sense of feeling no emotion, forces on the planet at the same time, the market and Mother Nature. And we're basically saying to both of them, what, what, what you got, baby? What you got? That's all you got? One degree centigrade rise in temperature, that's all you got? Little interest rate rise, that's all you got? Well, if that's all you got, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. And one day, we're going to wake up, and we're going to find out what they got. Because the mother nature, she's just chemistry, biology, and physics. That's all she is. You can't talk her up. You can't talk her down. You can't sweet talk her. You can't say, Mother Nature, uh, we've been having a bad subprime crisis. Could you take four years off? And the market, the market's just greed and fear, greed and fear, greed and fear at any millisecond around a stock, a bond, a commodity, a piece of real estate. And if you ask me what we're doing as a country right now, we're actually taunting both of them by not really rising to our debt and deficit challenge, and I would argue by not really rising to our climate and environmental challenge. And what basically we have been doing is practicing the exact same accounting in the market and mother nature at the same time. That is, we, we have been uh, massively underpricing risk, privatizing gains, and socializing losses. So in the subprime market, we massively underpriced the risk of giving all these people subprime mortgages. Uh, we have been allowing the people who did that to privatize the gains 
And then when they all blew up in 2008, we socialized the losses across the entire American economy. We're doing the exact same thing in the environment. We massively underpriced the risk of emitting all the carbon we're emitting. We uh, allow the people and companies that do that to privatize the gains. And then we socialize the losses in the form of carbon in the atmosphere that will come back in the form of disruptive climate change that we are basically charging on our kids' visa cards. So we're actually practicing the exact same accounting in both the market and mother nature. Now underlying this accounting are the exact same principles. And they're the principles of IBG and YBG. I'll be gone or you'll be gone. Um, uh, so I, I grant you a subprime mortgage, even though the only income you can, sh you want to buy a, a million dollar home, the only income you can show me is $10,000 and your only ID is your United Airlines Sky Miles card. But I grant you this mortgage um, because uh, I'll be gone. And by the way, if you miss the payments, you'll be gone. I then bundle these mortgages into a bond and I sell them to an unsuspecting bank in Dusseldorf. Uh, no problem, I'll be gone. Um, the problem is actually YBH. You'll be here. Okay? Um, we have been doing the exact same thing in the climate. We, um, you know, we sell off uh, uh, acres of, of the Amazon. Um, we engage in incredibly reckless climate behavior on the principle of... Uh, I'll be gone or you'll be gone. Now underlying this behavior has been a fundamental shift in values in the United States. And we have a, a chapter in the book about this um, called devaluation. Because I'm a big believer that our parents' generation, I think it applies to India as well, we're, we're our greatest generation. And in America at least, they built us this incredible world of abundance and freedom. And they did it practicing what I would call sustainable values. Values that sustain. Sustain relationships, communities, um, and businesses. They, they live by the principle, okay, too sustainable to fail, not too big to fail. I'm a baby boomer. I was born in the heart of the baby boom. My generation, we were the grasshopper generation. We ate it all. Almost all of it. We'll finish it all pretty much by the time we're done. And that means our kids need to be the regeneration. We and our kids, because we can't just abdicate this to them. Now my generation, we practice situational values. You do whatever the situation allows. The situation allows me to give you a mortgage for a million dollar home and you can only show $10,000 in income in your Delta Sky Miles card, no problem. I just do it. So my generation has been practicing situational values. Now the argument of our book is that if we don't get back to practicing sustainable values, that what freedom was for our parents' generation, defeating Nazism and totalitarianism, sustainable values are for our generation. If we don't bring sustainable values to the market and mother nature, they are individually and collectively going to pose, impose on our lifestyle so many constraints that it will be worse than had the Soviet Union won the Cold War. What, what freedom was for our parents' generation, sustainable values need to be for our generation. Now to tie all that, so that's sort of the global framework to answer Vikram's question. Whether Obama will rise to this, whether our Congress will rise to this, um, I'm very dubious. Uh, I think India and the United States face one very parallel structural problem as democracies. Um, I'll speak about America, and you can tell me after if this is right about India. But um, I believe we're trapped uh, in a, with a corrupt duopoly, basically. Our, our Congress today is a forum for legalized bribery. Okay. Um, uh, that's exactly what it is. And I believe that our politicians today think that um, they're in the business of winning elections and they're, uh, the, the people of the country, the consumers, are, um, are their voters. In fact, they should be in the business of governing and the people of the country should actually be treated as citizens. But that's, that's actually not the case. I was just in Silicon Valley two weeks ago, 
and I did a column about, you know, we always say that uh, America and Britain are two countries divided by a common language. Well, America is actually, Silicon Valley and Washington are two cities divided by a common language. Because in Silicon Valley, when you call someone a collaborator, it means it's someone you're partnering with to build something magnificent. And in Washington, D.C., when you call someone a collaborator, it means someone who's cooperated with the other party the way um, you know, uh, people in, uh, in France did with the Nazis. Okay? So the same word means two totally different things um, uh, on, on these two coasts. Now, it seems to me, before the election, you should know, I, I actually endorsed Michael Bloomberg um, for president. Um, I was for a third party. Uh, why was I for a third party? Uh, because, and this did not endear me to the president, um, uh, I'm a big believer life is about incentives. Move the cheese, you move the mouse. You don't move the cheese, the mouse doesn't move. And unless we change the incentives, and can demonstrate that there's a huge body of cheese actually in the middle of the political spectrum, unrepresented right now by either the left or the right, um, I don't see how the system changes. Uh, it'll only change at the margins. Now, we've had three experiences with this in our history. Um, Teddy Roosevelt and the progressive movement uh, ran as a third party. George Wallace um, did, unfortunately not an agenda I would approve of, but nevertheless had a huge impact. And, um, of course, Ross Perot did in 1992, the most successful third-party candidate. He made Bill Clinton a deficit reducer by proving, at one point, Ross Perot had 40% of the vote. He won 20% of the vote, by the way. And he was nuts. So imagine if you actually had a sane third-party leader right now, uh, like a Michael Bloomberg. I believe the impact would have been enormous. I urged Bloomberg to run. He was afraid he didn't want to elect a Republican. He basically didn't want to elect Romney by running as a third party. And I urged him to run just through the three presidential debates. Because I felt if he actually participated in the three presidential debates, we would have had a completely different debate. Um, and so uh, I guess that's uh, how I look at the American dilemma right now. So I would be right in saying that you are a frustrated person, not a frustrated optimist. No, well, why am I an optimist? I'm an optimist about America for the same reason I'm an optimist about India, because America, uh, and as I find in India, uh, America is still full of people, thank God, who just didn't get the word. Um, they didn't get the word that China's going to eat our breakfast. They didn't get the word that Germany's going to eat our lunch. And they just go out and invent stuff and start stuff and collaborate on stuff. I started this book tour at Knipiak University in New Haven. And uh, went to the campus, gave a talk. The president of the college said, could I meet with you for a few minutes beforehand? Paid a courtesy call, sat down to him. Just being polite, I said, what's new at Knipiak University, which I really didn't know much about. He said, we just built a medical school. This was 2011. I said, you just built a medical school. Didn't you get the word? We're in a recession. Everywhere I go in the country, I really find, thank God, America is still full of people who just didn't get the word. So my last book, Hot, Flat, and Crowded, was about energy. And I traveled all over America uh, talking about energy. And every talk I went to, um, I was besieged by people with energy innovations. It was amazing, no matter what city you went to. Mr. Friedman, I've got a duck. It paddles a wheel, blows up a balloon, it issues methane, turns a turbine. I heard the craziest stuff. But it told me the country was a lie. You want to be an optimist about America. Stand on your head. The country looks so much better from the bottom up than the top down. And I would do these lectures, and afterwards people would come up to me and, with their business cards. In and I would go back to my hotel room after these talks and empty my pockets of business cards from these energy interviews. Rock stars get room keys. I get business cards. But they're very exciting in their own way because they tell you the country is a lie. And that's why if I were to draw a picture of America today, it would be the picture of, a picture of the space shuttle taking off. You've seen that picture, all that incredible thrust coming from below. It's all those people who didn't get the word. Unfortunately, though, our booster rocket, Washington, D.C., is cracked and leaking energy, and the pilots in the cockpit are fighting over the flight plan. 
So right now we can't achieve escape velocity to get into the next orbit, but if we ever fix the booster rocket and get the pilots to stop fighting over the flight plan, watch out. We will absolutely separate ourselves. But uh, that's still a ways off. Well, that that's actually brings me to my second question, which is to do with foreign policy. I mean, Hillary Clinton was an able Secretary of State, but it appeared to me, at least, that America's foreign policy over the last four years was driven by domestic economic priorities. And uh, the expression of America's foreign policy was not through diplomacy, but through drone attacks, or not attacks, drones, and the special forces, or whatever. Um, and yet, you know, when, we, when you take a sort of view of the world, I mean, there's a crisis on almost every continent. Uh, and it's a crisis that can only be settled if you engage in traditional diplomacy. You know, you listen, you talk. So the question that I just wanted to ask you is, what do you think is the legacy that Hillary has bequeathed Kerry? What do you think should be Kerry's priorities? And what do you think Kerry's views on the subcontinent are likely to be? I have a flight at 3 a.m. I hope you all have time. <laughs> um, so, uh, well, let me say a few things. Uh, let's start with Hillary. Um, we actually had a chapter in our book that began with uh, the following story, that um, Hillary Clinton never would have asked my advice, career advice. Uh, but had she come to me and said, President Obama would like me to be Secretary of State, what do you think? Um, I said, uh, I would have told her, I actually told this to her face, that um, uh, you should say to him, Mr. President, that's very nice, but I'd actually like to have the top national security job. I'd like to be Secretary of Education. Um, and so um, Shashi's got that now here. I actually think that's actually the best, most important job in the world, in any country. It's actually very interesting. I studied Arabic and Middle East history in college. I wish I had studied education, because everywhere I go in the world, I find education is the number one issue. And what's really interesting, everyone thinks they're behind, no matter what country you go to. You go to Singapore, you know, their kids are killing it on the math test and they think they couldn't invent a hula hoop. You come to America, Johnny and Susie can't read past fourth grade, but Billy, who's got a ring in his nose, and Nancy, who's got a tattoo on her ear, just invented three new iPod apps. So everybody's got their kind of strengths and weaknesses but there's nobody who feels they've got it all. But why is education actually the most important national security issue? Because inclusive growth is actually the most important national or domestic security issue for every country. And in the world we're in, we'll talk a little about that shortly, education is actually the key to growth now and inclusive growth. So that's my bias to begin with. Secondly, I would say, Vikram, that it's not an accident that we have not had a um, consequential Secretary of State since Jim Baker. Um, that is to say, since the end of the Cold War. Um, I think Secretary of State today is the worst job in the U.S. government. And it's not an accident, if you read the stories about Hillary, that all of them refer to her greatest achievement as the number of miles she flew. Um, so we've actually gone from measuring our Secretary of States in mileage rather than milestones. So she flew more miles than Condi Rice, you know, as if that tells you anything, you know. Now why is that? It's because there are no more superpowers to deliver great treaties on arms control or even great treaties on climate. Um, and at the same time, so many of the states you have to deal with are failed and failing states. So if you're Secretary of State now, you get to start your day by calling Putin. Uh, Putin is a guy who, in put it American baseball terms, was born on third base and thinks he hit a triple. That is, he's sitting on a huge dome of oil and gas, and there is nobody who can tell him what to do at all. And um, so, you know, he's off uh, basically, um, you know, uh, banning Americans from adopting Russian children, even though 60,000 of them are desperately in need of adoption. That's how you start your day. Then you get to call the Chinese, who we owe so many dollars, no one can even count them anymore. Um, and, uh, and trying to move them on anything is you know, like moving mountains. Those are just the two people who answer the phone when you call. 
Then you get to call Karzai, uh, whoever is the prime minister of the week in Pakistan. Um, you can maybe then get to work in Mali. Um, uh, and then, if you're lucky, you can end the day calling Bibi Netanyahu in Israel, you know, who um, will basically tell you why he's going to bring down your government if you press him. So let's flash backwards for a second. 1973-74, you're Henry Kissinger. Think of the world Kissinger had to deal with and the world Hillary now deals with. In 1973, Kissinger actually made his first reputation as Secretary of State with shuttle diplomacy, negotiating the disengagement agreements between Syria, Israel, and Egypt after the 73 war. 30 days of shuttle diplomacy. Who did he have to deal with Kissinger? He had to deal with one Egyptian pharaoh named Anwar Sadat, one all-powerful Syrian dictator named Hafez al-Assad, and an Israeli Prime Minister, Golda Meir, who has such a big majority in their Knesset, no one had ever heard of the Likud opposition party. Now flash forward your Hillary. You get to deal with the Muslim Brotherhood president of Egypt, who right now has 100,000 protesters, literally as we speak, in the street outside his door. You know. um, and hasn't had time to even find the men's room yet. All right? Then you get to fly to Syria, and there's nobody in charge, basically. And then you get to fly to Israel, which has a coalition government that is so perfectly fragmented, it makes Indian governments look like a uniform united bloc. Okay? All right? That's your day as Secretary of State. So it is not an accident that we have not had a consequential Secretary of State since the end of the Cold War. So many of your conversations as Secretary of State now are to go to a country, sit across the table from the leader, ask them to pull a lever on the wall behind them. They go to pull the lever, and it comes off the wall in their hands. That's what it means to be Secretary of State now. And so, um, you know, I, I think it's a god-awful job. I think Secretary Kerry will, he comes with a lot of energy, a lot of ideas. Lord knows I wish him well. But, you know, I really believe that diplomacy is about leverage. I love to negotiate with people when I'm sitting here and they're sitting down there, when I have leverage. Um, negotiating with a country like Iran without leverage is like playing baseball without a bat. Um, you know, your hand gets a little hurt after a while. Right now, we, need to be, we have lost our leverage, I believe, as America because of what's happened with our economy and a lot of other things, wars in the Middle East. And um, me, I, I'd much rather be Secretary of Education. Right? Okay. Um, <laughs> end of that line of question. Of that, <laughs> <laughs> no, I was going to pursue it, but I think I'm going to leave that for the moment. And just maybe pick up on, 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 on your experience uh, with the Middle East. I, I, I know that you were at Tahrir Square and uh, I believe that you, um, you said somewhere that this was the most you know, extraordinary experience in your entire journalistic yes. career. So now when you look back, uh, well, at that time, let's say, all of us certainly felt that uh, democratization was in the air, that, um, uh, you know, there was going to be a, a sort of a sustainably stable yeah. kind of government. But today, the situation looks very different. So two questions get raised. One is, is there a sort of structural block to democracy in the Middle East? Or, the flip of that, is this protest that we see, whether it is protest in, in uh, Egypt or whether it's a civil strife in uh, Syria or whether what we see in Yemen and, uh, and Tunisia, is that just because the institutions of democracy had been so hollowed out, there were no institutions that, in a sense, the institutions had been so hollowed out that there is no way that the public can express their grievance. So this is, in fact, the first gasp of a democratic process. It's not the, there are no structural blocks. 
there is, in fact, this is the first step towards democracy. I don't know what you feel well, about that. Well, that's a good question, a good way to frame it, Vikram, and I would say this. So, I just finished, I, I, I wrote a book called From Beirut to Jerusalem, uh, which came out in 1989. It was my first book. And for the last 24 years, um, my publisher has been asking me to update it. And I told him um, I would, but it was going to be a very short, updated chapter. It was actually just going to be one page, one line. Nothing has changed. Um, and, uh, but I finally, um, in the wake of the Arab Spring, have just come out with a new updated version of Beirut to Jerusalem. Uh, and the chapter is called Watching Elephants Fly. Um, and it came from walking to Tahrir Square every day and realizing I was seeing something I'd never seen before. I was seeing something that was the political equivalent, something no, no one expected, anticipated. I was actually seeing elephants flying. And I have a rule of journalism. Whenever you see elephants flying, shut up and take notes. So that's actually my posture. There's a, there's a group of analysts out there who are in a competition for who can be the first on their block to say the Arab awakening will fail. It may already have failed. It may fail next year. It may fail, succeed, and fail again. But right now, as a journalist, I just want to take notes. Because another good rule of journalism is never be smarter than the story. Um, whenever you try to be smarter than the story, the story usually jumps up and bites you in the bottom. So my mode is just to, to sort of take notes. And here's what I, I saw. Um, when I came home from Tahrir Square, people said, what did you see? And I said, I actually saw a tiger that was living in a five by eight cage for 50 years get released. And there's three things I'll tell you about tiger. One, tiger is not going back in the cage. Two, do not try to ride tiger. Tiger rides only for Egypt. Do not try to ride tiger for the Muslim Brotherhood, for the generals. Tiger will ride only for Egypt. And lastly, tiger only eats beef. Because tiger has been fed every lie in the Arabic language, every bit of dog food and cat food for 50 years. Do not try to feed this tiger anything other than beef. And that's why the Egyptian generals, they actually, I, I realized this watching them. Because after they ousted Mubarak, their attitude was, n -n 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 nice tiger, g -g good tiger. Tiger just don't eat generals like Tiger ate General, uh, General Mubarak, okay? So there is something deep that came out here. And what came out was something as a journalist, if you see it once in your life, you are really lucky. And that is people losing their fear. That's an amazing thing. Now as a journalist in the Arab world for 25 years, I was acculturated to interviewing people by coming up and saying, just give me your first name. Uh, Muhammad, no, no, sir. Muhammad, how, how old are you, Muhammad? Uh, 19, thank you very much. I knew something had happened in Egypt. When I interviewed people in Tahrir Square, I said, uh, could, could I just get your first name? No, it's Muhammad Jabril Rashid. I'm 18 years old. I live at 10 Talat Harb Street. Here's my email. Here's my Twitter handle. I want this to go right to Mubarak. Watching people lose their fear, that's an amazing thing to see. And watching them recover their dignity, that is an amazing thing to see. This was the most humiliated population on the planet. And first and foremost, this was about dignity and people reasserting and recovering their dignity. Secondly, it was about justice. People living in a deeply unjust context. And lastly, it was about freedom, broadly construed, the freedom to live my life and reach my full aspirations. This revolution, I think, was driven primarily by young people living in what I would call a flat world and realizing they could not realize their own full potential. And that's why I always said afterwards that if I got to write the charge sheet against Mubarak, it would not be that he stole, you know, they said $70 billion. I don't think he actually stole very much money at all. I think he's guilty of something much worse. The soft bigotry of low expectations about his own people.
That is a terrible crime. I used to see Mubarak, and I, his, he always had the same line, Tomas, Tomas. You must understand, my people, they're like the Nile. They're very slow, you know. Bullshit like the Nile, okay? They wanted everything everybody else had. And that's why this revolution, you know, it was fed by many sources. When President Obama gave his lecture in Cairo, I actually wrote a column, just sort of, I mean, it was making it up in my head, not, not the facts, but the, the perception. When Obama spoke in Cairo, I wrote a column, I said, you know, I bet there's some Egyptian kid sitting there in the audience saying, he's dark-skinned, I'm dark-skinned. His name's Barack, my name's Barack. His grandfather's a Muslim, my grandfather's a Muslim. He's president of the United States, and I can't vote. Somewhere in there, oh, seeds were planted. I'll tell you, other seed that was planted, I'm sure of this, can't prove it, but Chinese Olympics. Chinese Olympics. You're in Cairo, and you're sitting around with the family watching the opening ceremony of the Chinese Olympics. And you know what you're saying to yourself? This was a, company, a country that had a lower per capita income than ours in 1952. And if we had 100 years, we could not put on that opening ceremony. So there are a lot of things that fed into this. So where are we today? I think, you know, Isaiah Berlin, the great philosopher, spoke of positive and negative freedom. Freedom from and freedom to. Well, we're finished with the freedom from stage of the Arab awakening. They now have their freedom from all these dictators. But the much more important phase, in a way, is freedom too. Can they collectively agree on what they want to be free to do? And right now you see three competing trends. One are people, like in Egypt, who want to be free to have more religion in their life. Second are people who want to be free to be more Alawite, more Sunni, more Shia, more Kurd more sectarian. And third are people who want to be free to be citizens. Citizens with real rights, responsibilities, and the opportunity to run across multi-sectarian lines. And those three are competing now. And I, I wouldn't begin to predict which would win. But what we're seeing here is the legacy of 50 years of a terrible trade. You know, in, in Korea, in Taiwan, in other parts of East Asia, leaders came to their people, metaphorically, and said, uh, we're going to take your freedom, but in return, we're going to give you great infrastructure and great education. And as a result of that trade, these countries eventually built up huge middle classes that actually peacefully took freedom from their governments. In the Arab world, leaders said, we're going to take your freedom, and we're going to give you the Arab-Israeli conflict. It was one of the worst trades in history. And as a result, they are really far behind. And if you ask me what I saw in Tahrir Square, I saw the most dangerous, explosive cohort in the world. The educated unemployed who aren't really educated. These kids don't have degrees from New Delhi IIT. This is an extremely dangerous cohort and full of frustration. And so um, I don't know how it's going to come out. You know, as I look across, because I was talking to friends here about this, India strikes me as a country that has um, uh, a weak government but an incredibly strong civil society. China strikes me as a country with a muscular government and a very weak civil society. Egypt is a country with a fat, flabby, overweight government and no civil society. And so now you've removed the state, there is no civil society, and that's why the Muslim Brotherhood was so able to quickly move in. So this is going to be a long transition. My only advice to my Indian friends is really two words. Solar power. You are now um, more and more dependent on the least stable part of the world. 
And you need to understand, we, through good fortune and dumb luck, have discovered natural gas. And as a result, the Middle East for us is shifting from a necessity to a hobby. Some days we'll get involved, some days we'll don't. Look how Hillary behaved. She behaved as if the Middle East was a hobby. Some days she'd work on it, some days she'd do her knitting. <coughs> So that is a huge geopolitical shift that's happening that I think India uh, really needs to be alive to. Well, let me, okay, let me just pick up on that last point of yours. So yes, America has had a, has a, had had a shale gas revolution. Um, all those companies that had invested in LNG regasification terminals to take care of LNG imports are now applying to turn those terminals, convert those terminals into LNG export facilities. America's dependence on the Middle East for oil and gas is going to reduce, if not completely, if not they'll be completely independent of it. I think what you will see from Secretary Kerry and from Obama is one really big, serious, good in uh, well-intended effort to reach a negotiated settlement with Iran. And let's see how that plays out before I think I would go anywhere beyond that. But I think that's the next move on this chessboard. So you are not, you are an optimist about the Iran, Israel, U.S. I'm imbroglio. Saying that, yeah, I, I'm mm -hmm. saying that I think there's going to be a real push to try to avoid a conflict. It may not work, I don't know. Um, but uh, I think that there's a lot of diplomacy that's going to happen first. Mm -hmm. So now, if I, you know, again, you talked about solar, and, uh, and this will be my last question, Please. and then I'm going to throw it open to, the, to my guests. But uh, it's, you talked about solar, but you know, it's, this, it's obviously the larger issue of climate change, and uh, you're very passionate, you've been a strong advocate. But um, I've, I've been, you know, I've, I've never really, frankly, understood how we can scale up renewables unless we also invest in uh, the appropriate distribution infrastructure. I mean, I, I recollect someone writing that uh, Edison illuminated Manhattan in 1885, but it was not until 1940, that is 45, 55 years later, that all the factories in America were able to convert from steam power to electric power. And the reason for that was because these factories were designed only to accommodate or to use steam power. So these factories had to be redesigned, in most cases they had to be rebuilt. So similarly, our energy system, whether it's in India, whether it's in the US, across the world, is actually built on fossil fuels. The transportation system is built on fossil fuels. There's no alternative to that right now. So whilst I have no doubt that technology will reduce the costs of renewables and make them competitive against fossil fuels, and particularly gas, if not oil, and perhaps in the long term coal as well, I just wonder where is the investment going to be? In, where is the investment in the smart infrastructure required to bring that to the consumer. And I'm not sure if well, you've written about that or if you've thought yeah. about that, but... Uh, no, I've thought about it a lot. Um, so we just took four years off, mm -hmm. so let's start there. Uh, <laughs> the president actually mentioned climate change in his inauguration. It was the first time he's used that phrase um, uh, in a high-profile way. I mean, he might have whispered it a couple times in, um, in probably the last two and a half years. <laughs> so um, people got all the Twitter that the president mentioned climate change. You know. That shows you how, I mean, climate change basically became a four-letter word on Obama's first-term watch. Um, so that was for pure politics, because the pollsters tested it, and it didn't play well. Um, so think about this. We talk about scale. Um, we just, our, our Senate and House, just appropriated the money for the cleanup of the Sandy Superstorm. The bill for Sandy was exactly $60.4 billion. The same week that we did that, President Obama secured a tax hike 
on every American who makes more than $450,000 and above, your taxes went up from 35 to roughly 39 percent. That will raise exactly $60.4 billion every year for the next 10 years. So the entire tax hike for 2013 went to paying for one storm. So that's the scope of what we're, what we're dealing with. You're absolutely right, Vikram. Uh, energy is a scale problem. If you don't have a scale solution, you don't have a solution. You have a hobby. And I wouldn't try to take on Mother Nature as a hobby. Um, you have to have a systems response because systems allow ordinary people to do extraordinary things. That's the meaning of a system. That I can walk into a building or a hotel room and the lights go on or off automatically, that's because you have a system. So we are very far away from a systems response because what you need are basically the government to raise efficiency standards, reinforce that with some kind of carbon tax. That creates a huge market. Investors see that market. They then are ready to invest in both deployment and research. That then, you raise the, the standards. The more you raise the standards, the more your industry, your air conditioners, your cars become global solutions and move down the cost volume curve. We do that in California. People in California actually pay $1,000 less a year X temperature for their energy bills because they have that kind of system. But we don't have it anywhere else. So, you know, the, the motto of climate science, you know, is um, manage the unavoidable and avoid the unmanageable. Okay? That's what we have to do. We have to manage what is going to be unavoidable and avoid the unmanageable. But basically what we are doing in America, I would argue on both the debt and the climate, is we are, we're basically waiting for the perfect storm in both, in both arenas. That is, we're waiting for a storm that's big enough to finally end this stupid debate, but not so big as to end the world. That's really what we're waiting for. And uh, hopefully that will happen uh, sooner um, uh, rather than later. Okay, can I... Um yeah, can I, can I um, maybe now just turn to the, um, uh, to my guests, and I'm sure many of them have um, Please. questions, and uh, there are two mics, um, so is, is that Jay? Yeah, Jay, uh, can you, um, and Hush. Sorry, can you hear? You referred to structural problems that democracies have, uh, such as the U.S. and India. Certainly in India, there are some that think, we ha that, think that we have too much democracy and have uh, more than a bit of China envy. Do you believe that China, the model that it follows in, in governance, in its economics, is more sustainable, has an inherent advantage for the foreseeable future? Or do you believe that democracies like America and India uh, have inherent advantages that can see them beyond the present model that they find themselves in, in the medium to long term? Uh, which way do you weigh in? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, I get the same question in China. Um, so um, my view is that um, India and America um, have the best political system and China has the worst political system. But I believe China is getting 90% out of a bad system and we're getting 50% out of a really good system. And that that's really what we have to work on, both of us in our, in our own ways. You know. and, um, but I would not trade your system or my system for their system in a second. Um, uh, I think, as I said, they have a very strong government but an incredibly brittle government. Um, I bet you, if we could actually get the data, there is no government in the world that polls more than the Chinese government. Okay. Because when your legitimacy basically is, is always in question, you're always polling. So I, I think there's a, a real brittleness there. Uh, at the same time, infrastructure, education, that does matter, and being able to deliver that at scale. And so I don't... Um, uh, I wouldn't diminish that for a second. But I think we've got to get our governance, you know, 
um, at the level that more and more people are going to start to demand. So if you ask me, what did I learn on this trip to India? Um, this really, I wrote, I wrote my column for tomorrow about it. I, I would tell you the following. Uh, this requires first, you know, um, let me start with the plumbing, because I'm a plumber um, at root. I always like to know where the technology is, because once they know where the technology is, then I have a better idea of kind of what is or is not possible. So, some of you probably heard me say this before, but in 2004, I wrote a book called The World is Flat, started in Bangalore in a conversation with uh, uh, Nanda Nilakani. Um, that was a book about how the world is getting connected. In 2011, I wrote this new book with uh, Michael Mandelbaum about America. And when I sat down to write the new book, the first thing I did was get the first edition of The World is Flat off my bookshelf, just to remember what I said. Um, I cracked it open to the index, looked under A, B, C, D, E, F, 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 A. Facebook wasn't in it. So when I was running around saying, the world is flat, we're all connected, Facebook didn't exist, Twitter was still a sound, the cloud was still in the sky, 4G was a parking place, LinkedIn was a prison, applications were what you sent to college, Big Data was a rap star, and Skype was a typo. <laughs> All of that happened after I wrote The World is Flat. What does that tell you? What it tells me is that we've actually gone from a connected world to a hyper-connected world. This is a difference of degree that's a difference in kind. But it was completely masked, I would argue, by post-9-11 in America and the subprime crisis. So I call that the Great Recession, and I call this move from connected to hyper-connected the Great Inflection. We've just had a huge inflection point. Now what I found fascinating here this week, and this is the, my column I wrote tomorrow, my column I wrote tomorrow is called India's Virtual Middle Class. Because what I think the hyper-connected world has done is push down tools and education opportunities that were traditionally reserved for only families in the middle class down to millions of more Indians. So you, I think India today has like 300 million people in the middle class and it's now got 300 million or heading toward that in a virtual middle class. That is, they actually have now connectivity tools and they have educational opportunities that would normally be associated with the middle class, even if they don't have the incomes of the middle class. So they're a virtual middle class. But I think from the government's point of view, what this means, though, is they are going to be demanding the same kind of good governance, services, uncorrupt police that the middle class were, were, were demanding. And they'll be able to do it at a degree of connectivity you've never seen before. I think that's a really interesting phenomenon. I think the same thing is going on in China. We had this terrible rape story here um, that I don't have to tell you about. But in the same week in China, there was another violation that happened. The Chinese censor walked into Southern Weekly on New Year's Eve and rewrote the editorial from a criticism of the government to a laudatory panegyric of the government. And Chinese journalists went nuts. Using Weibo Twitter, they basically, they, 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 they mounted a mini revolt. And by the way, it's very interesting, none of them have been arrested. I think the government was really afraid. Now, I think the expansion of people in the middle, joining the middle class in their minds, if not in their wallets, which is really a product of the hyper-connecting in the world and the driving down of all these tools. I think that's really cool. But what it means is something that, that this hyper-connected world means for every government. Everyone today in authority is in a two-way conversation. The days of one-way conversation, top-down, are over. We are all in a two-way conversation now. My column runs on NewYorkTimes.com. 
and underneath it, on any given day, maybe 400 comments that are as long as my column with my, with my readers. Everyone today is in a two-way conversation. The only question is when you learn that. So Reed Hastings ran a company called Netflix in America, and two years ago he decided to change his pricing model without telling his customers. He lost 800,000 customers in 48 hours. They said, no, excuse me, Mr. Hastings, we're in a two-way conversation with you. You don't just raise your prices without talking to us, and he had to back down. The same month, Putin came before the Russian people and said, oh, oh, I, we, 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 we didn't tell you. Medvedev and I, we, we decided to switch jobs. I didn't tell you? Oh, it slipped my mind. The Russian people say, excuse me, Putin, we are in a two-way conversation now. So everybody's in a two-way conversation, including the Indian government, including the American government. And I think now that you've got a middle class and a virtual middle class, I think there's going to be a lot more pressure faster for the level of governance services that um, were normally confined to a smaller segment of the population because other people were so concerned with just their basic needs. Now the other implication of this, and this is more for America, but I think it will hit India soon, is when the world gets this hyper-connected, the single most important fact is that average is officially over. Average is over. We have a saying in Texas, if all you ever do is all you've ever done, all you'll ever get is all you ever got. That is no longer applicable. If all you ever do is all you've ever done now, all you'll ever get is not all you ever got. You will get below average. I live in Bethesda, Maryland, 45 minutes from Baltimore. 50 years ago, the biggest employer in Baltimore was Bethlehem Steel Company. You could drop out of high school, join the steel union, get an average job at Bethlehem Steel to buy an average home with an average yard, to have 2.0 average kids, lead a very nice average American lifestyle, work for an average number of 30 years, have an average retirement, go to an average number of baseball games, and have a wonderfully average funeral. Today, the biggest employer in Baltimore, Bethlehem Steel, is long gone. It's a distant memory. Is Johns Hopkins University Medical Center. They don't let you mow the grass there without a BA. So what's happening with hyperconnectivity is every boss in the world today has cheaper, easier, faster access to more above average automation, software, robotics, cheap genius, and cheap labor than ever before. And I believe that's what triggered the Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, very easy for you to say, Mr. Smarty Pants, New York Times columnist. No, let me tell you about my job. I inherited James Reston's office at the Washington Bureau of the New York Times in 1995. What an honor to inherit the office of this great columnist and editor of the 60s and 70s. I suspect Mr. Reston used to come to the office in the 60s and 70s and say to himself every morning, I wonder what my seven competitors are going to write today. And he personally knew all seven. Walter Lippmann, Mary McGrory, Stuart Alsop, Joseph Kraft, Walter, uh, uh, Tony Lewis. I know them. I do the same thing. I come to the office every morning and I say, I wonder what my 70 million competitors are going to write today. I have 70 million competitors. But now here's what's really interesting. We now have New York Times .com .india Inc. And the New York Times India Bureau Chief is here, Jim Yardley. He's happy to tell you all about it. We have a million readers a month on India Inc. now on NewYorkTimes.com. We just were trying to open a Chinese version of NewYorkTimes.com, which I was on my way to Beijing to give the opening talk at when we also published an article that Wen Jiaobao's mother was worth $2 billion and they unplugged NewYorkTimes.com.cn. But we'll get there. Now, what does that mean for me as a columnist at the New York Times? 20 years ago, when I would come to India, I had one goal in mind, 
tell my mother-in-law in Chicago something she didn't know about India. My mother-in-law had never been to India, so that was relatively easy. I could write an average column, and that would perfectly satisfy my mother-in-law. What is my goal today when I come to India? When we have India Inc., it's to tell Indians something they don't know about their country. Oh, that's a much harder job. I have to work much harder, talk to many more people, think smarter to do that. Average is over for me. Because I know people in Chennai are going to read that column as well as people in Chicago. So I would argue this is happening throughout the economy. Now, if you haven't read the book, there's a wonderful book by two MIT scholars, um, James McAfee and Eric Brynholson, called Race Against the Machine, which translates what I'm telling you into sort of more classical economic language. And what they point out in their book is that there are three things for the last 200 years that rose together. Productivity, median income, and employment. So whether it was India or America, you knew as a country, if your productivity was steadily improving, it meant your median income was improving and your employment was improving. With this hyper-connecting of the world, that's broken down in the last five years. Productivity is going through the roof, yet median incomes in America are flat, if not declining, and unemployment is stuck at almost 8%. Why is that? It's for three reasons, they argue. The first is that when the world gets this hyper-connected, every job can go either out, an American job can come to India, or it goes up. That is, it requires more skill to do. I'm telling you, my job, I feel, requires me to muster more skill to do, but that's true of every job. So you get something called, in the language, skills bias polarization. And that's why unemployment rate in America for people with a four-year college degree today is 3.6%. Unemployment for people who have dropped out of high school is infinity. The, the returns to education today, goes back to what we were talking earlier, in a hyper-connected world are greater than ever. Second thing that happens when the world gets this hyper-connected is that owners of capital get so much more of the profit than owners of labor. Because, you know, there's an old joke in America, or new joke in America, uh, the modern American factory consists of just two employees, a man and a dog. The man is there to feed the dog, and the dog is there to keep the man away from the machines. It isn't quite that bad, but it's heading in that direction. So owners of capital now are capturing so much more of the profit than labor. And lastly, if you're a superstar now, if you're um, uh, Madonna, in a hyper-connected world where every Indian kid has an iPod and can download your song, your returns are exponentially greater than the singer just a little behind you. So for all these reasons, we're seeing a disaggregation of productivity, median income, and employment. I think it's the most important issue in the world today that everyone's going to have to solve how do we live in a world where the American middle class for 50 years was built on something called the high-wage, middle-skill job? High-wage, middle-skill job. How do we maintain political stability and democracies when there is no such thing anymore as the high-wage, middle-skill job? There will only be the high-wage, high-skill job. And that is going to be a huge, I think, education challenge and a huge social challenge and if you want to know what I'm really thinking about, it's not the future of the Arab-Israeli conflict. It's that question. Because that is where the core of the stability of the middle class will be. And without a healthy, vibrant middle class, you will not have sustainable or stable democracy. Okay. Short that, answer that to is a long a <laughs> question. <laughs> so I'm going to maybe, I, I don't want to, you know, uh, Go on all night. I my, uh, you know, I, I did ask, I did say you'd be with us for one hour on this, on together, you know, in this, in this conversation, and, and I don't want to Please. extend it too, too much. But I'll have one last question, if I may, and that was Harsh, and then uh, where's Harsh? I didn't see him. Yeah. There he is. I'm here. I'm behind this. Okay. Uh, quick question. Um, I'm right here. He's over there. Okay. Uh, that 
with the discovery of um, shale energy, do you think that will bring back the United States into uh, manufacturing in a more serious way? And the second quick follow-up to that is with the discovery again uh, of, of shale energy and therefore it's less dependence in the Middle East. Do you think the United States' interest in the Middle East will really be uh, veering towards um, watching terrorism? Right. Good question. So let's go to shale oil first, shale gas. Um, uh, I don't, you know, let's remember one thing. First of all, America and China actually in dollar terms manufactured the exact same amount. So we are, we are not out of manufacturing. We just manufacture that amount with 10 million people and they do it with 100 million people. So I don't think that's going to change much because what actually is defining uh, modern manufacturing today is the level of skill you need to do your just typical manufacturing job. You need to know algebra and you need to know calculus in order to do work in a modern American factory today, to program a machine, to, um, uh, to really be a, a, a productive worker. And so that's going to be, that's the real challenge. And shale gas at the margin can help that, but that doesn't, you know, mean you don't have the education challenge. Um, in terms of the Middle East, I exaggerate. We know there's a global oil market. And if somehow there were a war that cut off oil and gas from the Middle East, it would affect, obviously, what we pay as well. We're not going to be indifferent to that. It would affect Europe. It would affect allies like India. So we will still remain involved. Um, but I think that uh, at the margins is all I'm saying. We managed to ignore it for the last four years, the Arab-Israeli conflict. So, um, and, and part of that, I think it's a huge problem, challenge for Israel, because basically all the Arab states around it are collapsing. So the traditional pressure on Israel to move ahead with the Palestinians has been diminished. And so the asymmetry in power between Israel and the Palestinians alone, which could only be evened out by the United States putting its thumb on the scale and the other Arab countries, that's really disappearing. And that's why you see basically what you see. So, um, you know, I, I, let me just conclude by, by, first of all, thanking Vikram for putting on this wonderful evening and to Brookings, but um, you know, there's one thing I do every trip I make to India, um, and that is I ask NASCOM to um, get me together with their most exciting young entrepreneurs. And last night, USAID did the same with their most exciting Indian social entrepreneurs. And um, the hyper-connected world is giving these young people incredible tools via the cloud, open source that brings together their creativity and imagination that leaves me more excited than ever. And that's the thing you got to remember about the hyper-connected world. On one hand, it makes average over, and on the other hand, it's giving more people the ability to be above average at less price faster than ever before. My column last Sunday was about MOOCs, massive online open courses that Stanford, MIT, and Harvard are, are, are uh, developing, this is going to be, this is going to be a revolution. Because Indian kids in uh, the smallest village, Egyptian kids, or frankly, kids in, rural Washington, in urban Washington, D.C., are going to get access to the greatest lectures of the world. It's going to flip these classrooms. It's, I, I wrote about the, the biggest one of these, Coursera, in May when they opened. They had five schools and 330,000 students. I interviewed them last week, six months later. They have 33 universities and 2.4 million students in six months. And this is going to give high quality education to more and more people than ever. The only differentiator is who has the governance right, who has the booster rocket right, and the pilots with the sort of agreed on flight plan to um, to take advantage of what I think is going to be incredible, more energy than ever coming from below. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much, Tom. It's, this is a, a great start for Brookings in India. Uh, your generosity 
is going to give us a lot of encouragement, and I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for, for being here. And, uh, and I would look forward to your support in making Brookings in India a very successful think tank, as is the case with Brookings internationally.